Hi, everyone. Welcome to Being Patient Brain Talks. I'm Deborah Khan, founder of Being Patient. Well, um, if you're anything like me um, and have a loved one who has a neurodegenerative disease, you start to worry about your own memory and how well your brain is working. So today we thought we would take some time to really delve into um, whether or not we can make our brains better, stronger, and rehabilitate them if there is indeed a memory problem. So I'm pleased to announce today we have uh, Dr. Majib Fatuhi. He is affiliated with Johns Hopkins, and he is the medical director of um, NeuroGrow, which is literally a re uh, rehabilitation program for your brain. Thanks very much, um, Dr. Fatuhi, for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Okay, so let's just start um, very simply. And, um, you know, you know, as I age, I'm a middle-aged woman, and I uh, sometimes really worried about my memory. Um, and I often think, are there things I can do to improve my memory today, or is it too late? Well, it's absolutely not too late at all. Uh, there are lots of things that you can improve your brain health and brain function. A lot of people assume that when they get older, uh, they cannot improve their brain function, and that's absolutely wrong. There are so many things you could do. In fact, I've written three books on this topic, and I can talk hours about this. But the short answer is yes. Uh, your brain has a high degree of malleability. Your brain has what's called neuroplasticity, and there are many things you could do to make your brain younger by six years or even 10 years. So a lot of people um, call your brain, you say that your brain acts like a muscle. Like we know we can lift weights and make our muscles a lot stronger. Um, obviously the brain is not a muscle, but how does it act like one? Like what is happening to our brains um, when we say uh, make them stronger? <clears throat> Your brain is made up of cells called neurons, and neurons have extensions which connect with other neurons. And your brains have a milieu of blood vessels where there are thousands of blood vessels and capillaries that feed the neurons and the connections between neurons. Um, we know for a fact that there are many things that you can improve your brain function by, number one, increasing the number of neurons for example, when you exercise a lot, you have more neurons. That is really incredible that you can create new neurons with vigorous exercise. Number two is that you can make more of those fiber bundles, so those like the little highways from one side of the brain to the other side of the brain. The more you use your brain, the more you solidify these connections between different parts of the brain. Number three is that you can have more synapses. When a neuron approaches another neuron, and touches it, or almost touches it, uh, <clears throat> it provides support for communication. And the more of these synapses you have, the stronger will be the communication between different neurons in different corners of your brain. And needless to say, if you have a lot of synapses, you can think better, you can solve more problems, you can remember better. And number four is that you can have more blood vessels. The more you exercise or when you meditate, you actually create more of these branches of blood vessels which carry more oxygen and nutrients to your brain. So there are four ways that you can literally grow your brain and make your brain a healthier and stronger brain. And these things don't require years of uh, work to get there. Uh, with our brain fitness program, which is a brain rehabilitation program, people achieve results with, within uh, three months. Okay, so uh, obviously I want to hear more about the brain rehabilitation program, but I want to understand, and I've often wondered about this, when you when when those changes are happening. I mean, I'm a runner, so I run every morning, and I'm I've now interviewed enough scientists to know that I'm actually adding brain cells to my hippocampus um, with aerobic exercise. Um, you know, a, a, um, quite a consistent amount of aerobic exercise. Does that mean though, when we are when we say we're making our brains stronger, does that mean we're getting smarter? Does it just mean that our memory will, uh, will be enhanced? What does it mean in terms of our behavior and how it manifests at, um, you know, in, inside and, and outside of our brains? 
All right, I just happen to have a brain. <laughs> and okay, so your brain has different corners, different areas. And, um, and there's a part of the brain in front that's important for um, attention, concentration. And there's a part of the brain in the side, which is important for um, memory. And you can work out these different brain areas just like you can work out different muscles. So if you were to improve your attention, Debra, you can work on your frontal lobes. You can make your frontal lobes much stronger. And that's if not exercise. Is that something else? Um, so when you exercise, you increase blood flow and synapses and fiber bundles throughout your brain. So exercise is one of those things that is helpful for all brain areas. But if you had, for example, poor attention, and you wanted to improve the attention parts of your brain, then you can focus on doing targeted brain games. So you can do brain games that challenge your attention and concentration. For example, you can memorize a deck of cards, or you can um, play brain games that require you to think fast, solve problems fast, and respond fast. Um, if you have difficulty with uh, navigation, for example, you can work on brain areas that are important for navigation. Your brain has different components and different components of the brain are associated with different brain functions. And if you do targeted brain training, you could improve those specific parts of the brain. That's what we do here. For example, if somebody comes and we do a cognitive evaluation and we find that um, their memory is okay, but their processing speed is slow, which they perceive as memory problems. A lot of people call memory problems their brain problems, even though the specific cognitive domain that's affected may not be memory, maybe thinking is slower. To them, thinking is slower is memory problems. Because if they have to remember something, it will take them longer to remember it, so they call it a memory problem. So if you give someone the brain games to think faster, they will think faster and their memory will be better. Because there's a lot of controversy around brain games. You know, I've talked to people who say, oh yeah, they definitely, certain games definitely work and certain don't. But like, as what you are saying, I can't help but think about, uh, you know, I've always thought I had an attention problem. I was, I've always been ADD and the, the way I deal with it is to run and it improves my concentration um, immensely. Um, so I can, I can imagine that this is um, good for people all ages. So kids who maybe have attention problems, can you, can you improve their memory function or their processing um, um, speed by, by using brain games? Yes. The problem with lack of sufficient evidence to support the idea that brain games are helpful has to do with the way we measure brain function. See, if you do a brain game that makes you think faster and then you give someone a test of cognitive abilities that may or may not have a component for processing speed, you may not see results. Also, if you give him a test uh, and a test has different component, and then you have a summary total number at the bottom, and you've done brain games and you haven't seen results, it's because the results you have produced has been diluted in the overall cognitive evaluation that was done. You see what I'm saying? It's like, I work on your biceps, and then I ask you to run, and you don't run any faster. Well, we work on your biceps, and working the biceps is not going to necessarily improve your leg muscles. And that's what the problem is with lack of sufficient evidence in the literature to support brain games are good. You need to have targeted brain games for specific cognitive deficits people have. See, to me, Deborah, a big problem these days has to do with the fact that we don't measure cognitive function. We just talk about, oh, my brain is not working well. And whether if you do certain brain games or if you exercise or if you take certain supplements, whether or not uh, your brain function has improved. But your brain is such a complex organ with so many functions. And unless you look specifically uh, as to which part of brain you were targeting to improve and which brain functions actually improve, then you won't see results. You need to be more 
target it in terms of deficits and the results you're looking for. And yes, people who have attention problems as kids or as, as adults, if they do the kind of things we recommend, such as exercise, eating well, sleeping well, and getting targeted brain uh, games, they will definitely improve. In the program that we published in our brain fitness program here, it's a 12 weeks of brain training, which people can do on their own. Nothing we do here is magical. You know, uh, I've, I've outlined all everything we do here in my book. And there are common sense things like, you know, lifestyle modifications, brain training, sleeping well, things you've heard elsewhere. But you need to do it like you mean it. I guess, you know, I think you are a kind of person who has that kind of lifestyle, who because of all the things you've been reading about, you know what's good, what things are good for you and you do it. So um, we found that in our patient population of elderly in their 60s and 70s, 84% of patients had a statistically significant improvements in their cognitive abilities. And the, the summary of the cognitive function improved significantly. 84% of elderly improved. And I think it has nothing to do with anything magical we do other than the fact that we coach patients the same way you coach someone to play basketball better, to have better function here, to remember better, to think faster, to sleep better and so forth. So the short answer is, um, our brain has a lot of malleability. That malleability is present throughout life. That if you do targeted brain training in the setting of everything else, such as diet, exercise, sleep, you see results. The other reason people don't see results in with brain games is has to do with the, the diversity of populations that are being tested. So if you have people who have diabetes or obesity or insomnia or anxiety or depression, those factors individually can affect the brain function. And if you give someone brain games, some of them improve, some of them don't. So the net result is you have failed to see benefits, but it has to do with how bad a problem they have and what other coexisting issues they have. Someone who has depression, obesity, sleep apnea, may be so profoundly affected that giving them brain games that improve their brain function by 5% will not make a noticeable change in day-to-day -day, day -day life. So um, I have a lot of questions in, in, in that. That's, a, that's great information. Um, when you were testing members, so I, I guess the key takeaway right now is like, like in terms of your research is you really have to understand where the weaknesses are and where the problems lie before you treat them. So there's not like a generic brand of like, oh, do this. I lost you for a second. Oh, I'm sorry. I, am I back? Repeat the, yeah, repeat the last question. Okay, so I was saying the fact that um, you really have to analyze where the problems and the weaknesses are before you can actually come up with the right solution. Is, is that fair to say? So not all brain games are going to work for everybody. You have to understand exactly. where the weaknesses are. Exactly. And it has to be the right level of difficulty. You know, again, uh, using the analogy with muscles, if you take two pound dumbbells and you do 20 dumbbells at two pounds, don't expect to see significant changes in your biceps. Um, it has to be in the right amount of difficulty where you're, where you're challenged without being overwhelmed. So that's the other important factor in terms of brain games and brain training. So um, with your research, um, okay, it's been applied. I mean, is it, is it, have you applied this to neurodegeneration? I mean, people with Alzheimer's or dementia, can, can, is it too late for people who have um, neurodegeneration or can you actually improve, work against the disease to perhaps slow it down and improve your memory? I wish I could tell you that we had magical results and it improved. Unfortunately, by the time a person crosses the line of becoming um, demented, if they cognitive function is so bad that they don't know what year it is and uh, forget the names of their family members, unfortunately, uh, we have not seen significant improvement in those kinds of patients. We have seen some patients who come and assist on doing the program, even though I don't recommend it for people with significant cognitive deficits. Um, 
the results have been interesting in that we see patients become calmer, um, they smile better, they smile more, they sleep better. So there's some mild benefits from these sort of things for patients who already have significant cognitive deficits. But people who benefit the most are people in their 50s and 60s who have started to have cognitive deficits who then do these sort of things in, an, in a coordinated uh, fashion with close monitoring so that we can capture the improvements. So can you give me um, an example, Dr. Fatuhi, of um, like if I came to you and let's say you said, oh, you know, Deborah, you have attention problems or processing problems. What what would you prescribe me? What is um, what what is the brain rehab actually look like? OK, um, so again, talking with you, I don't get the impression that you have any significant deficits. And we do have patients like you who come with concerns for Alzheimer's disease because their mom or dad has Alzheimer's disease. And we do a thorough cognitive evaluation. And a cognitive evaluation shows how you perform compared to people your age. Uh, so we see that somebody uh, like you comes has a verbal memory score, which is at 70 percentile, which means only 30 percent of people are better than they are. And other people are at 55 percentile and, and so forth. And we provide reassurance for people in those kind of profiles that even though they uh, have some memory lapses that may forget names, their, their symptoms are not clinically significant or worrisome. And that means a lot for patients who in their own heart, in their own mind, think they have Alzheimer's disease. And that reassurance really helps them feel better and have less anxiety about possibility of uh, developing Alzheimer's disease decades later. But then we also do uh, see patients who come with concerns for memory. And then when we do the cognitive testing, we find that, for example, the processing speed is slow or their executive function, their ability to be organized, plan and execute things, uh, score, their score for the executive function is low or the, exec, uh, the score for attention is low. So we have a specific uh, set of problems when uh, a patient starts the program. And we share that results with them, say, look, your uh, processing speed is at 13th percentile, and we want to get at least to 50 percentile. So this is one area we're going to focus on. We also uh, obtain blood test results. I find a lot of patients who have low B12 levels or vitamin D levels or thyroid problems. Um, and those are all things that I treat in parallel to the program. And when they start the program, they meet with our brain coaches who are trained to provide brain training for our patients. And we have a set of 20 brain games with different features and we put them in different categories for attention, concentration, memory, or executive function. So somebody with processing speed would get a set of brain games that require them to think faster and be able to process information quickly. And they come here twice a week. They also get biofeedback. Uh, it was called neurofeedback, which is a way of improving their attention and concentration. So they come here uh, twice a week and each time they're here for uh, one and a half hours, two 45 minute sessions. At six weeks, we repeat the cognitive testing and majority of the time, maybe 90% of the time, people have had some improvements. We also uh, uh, put their symptoms in a spider diagram, which shows uh, the types of problems that they report having. Uh, some people report having problems with memory, attention, remembering names, navigation, different problems. So we have a full index of the symptoms they have, and we have uh, objective measure of their cognitive function. So at six weeks, we compare results. And we expect that the severity and the frequency of the symptoms they have has improved. And we also see that their scores for specific cognitive domains have improved. And sometimes, you know, uh, their attention may improve from, let's say, 13 percentile to 42 percentile, and executive function has gone from, let's say, 20 to 26 percentile. So it looks like we need to 
focus on the executive function a little bit more. So on the second part of the program, we repeat the whole thing, and by the time they finish, most of the time, 90% of the time at least, uh, people have remarkable results. People say, oh my God, I feel better, I sleep better, I can think better. Um, what I find so surprising, Deborah, is that again, we don't do anything magical. You know, we provide targeted brain games, which people can do on their own. We encourage them to eat better, exercise more, sleep better. And, you know, we provide them with information about uh, meditation. And all of them are fairly inexpensive and readily available. But what I find interesting is how people improve in, uh, with significant changes in the cognitive test results. Mm -hmm. Like not only they feel better, but the results show objective improvements. But is it is it much like lifting weights where you have to keep up the exercise, otherwise yes. you're going to slide back to where you are? Yes. Um, so it is. It is. So because, because the thing is, though, what has happened is I have seen a lot of patients who come, they do our program for three months, and I see them three or six months later. And the majority of the time, their results are within 5% up and down from when they left here. And the, the reason is when people start doing the kind of things that we teach them to do, they enjoy it so much that it becomes a part of their daily routine. I think, you know, you have a daily routine of running and doing certain things. It takes a while for you to have a daily routine. For example, you don't smoke. I'm sure you don't smoke. Or, or you know, how much you drink or you don't drink. Or how much you... Um, spend with meditation or how much you spend with socialization or things. But the things that you do as habits are things that you're convinced in your heart of hearts to be good for you, good or bad. And so what we do for our patients is that because they come here twice a week for 12 weeks and we show them uh, uh, evidence as to why these things improve the brain, they pick up new habits, but those habits become their part of daily routine right and okay. they don't they don't decline i was just going to ask you if i could have just one vice <laughs> um i like my red wine <laughs> i think what red wine is very good i think um i originally uh tell patients who have memory problems to stop drinking because <clears throat> if you have memory problems drinking is not good for you mm. Um, but if somebody doesn't have memory problems, uh, exercises and it does everything else right, then I think it's fine. I tell people you have to earn your glass of wine. Okay, I got it. Okay, we have some questions coming in. Um, one viewer is asking how long do the results last for before, you know, but I think you've kind of answered that. You just have to keep going, right? You have to keep exercising. What I find interesting is that when patients improve, they're so thrilled with the results that they stick with the new habits they have formed. For example, we encourage people to do some kind of brain games, whether it's Sudoku or something on there. There are so many uh, free brain games online these days. Uh, one is called like elevate.com or um, there are many of them that are even free. Um, or just try to figure things out. Like if the microwave is broken or if, if something in the garage is not working, work on it right and so as long as you sustain that level of uh, curiosity and you exercise and you eat right your brain will continue to improve further and further my goal for getting older is to have a better memory every year so i'm 57 now i want to have a better brain at 58 and i want to be sharper when i'm 60. Okay, so that's um, another question that's been asked is how much of a difference does age make in the success of rehab? So as we age, you know, our memories tend to get worse. So is it harder? Is it just like kind of maybe exercise riding up that hill on your bike isn't quite as easy in your 50s as it was in your 40s? Is it the same? Yes, the short answer is yes. Um, Again, we analyze the data from our patients who are 60s to early 80s, and we saw the best results for patients who had milder problems uh, and they were younger. So a 63-year-old who had a 30% decline in their memory and a 40% decline in their processing speed 
had much better results after three months than an 84-year-old who would have 80% decline in their memory and a 90% decline in their processing speed. I think the best time to uh, invigorate your brain and have new habits, if you don't have it already, is in your 40s and 50s. Mm -hmm. But it's never too late. You know, I had a patient who was 79 years old, and he, she memorized a list of 100 words. Um, and so we do have patients who are older. They may require more than three months, but their brain has plasticity, and they may need to have more patience to get to where they want to be. Uh, it's not that they can't. It just takes more effort. Right. Okay. And and the a follow up to that, and I <laughs> kind of what I have. I, I I'm wondering how many people have you put through this program? How much data do you have? Number one and number two. As a follow up, um, someone this same person is asking, are these results observed only within the game, or do you have some proof of generalization of the results? So, how much data is behind all this? How many patients have you put through this? Um, you know, how how much is really tested? Yeah, so uh, I started a formal uh, program in uh, 2011. And uh, we saw patients and we decided to actually do a clinical trial in 2014, 2015. And we published the results in the Journal of Prevention of Alzheimer's Disease in 2016 based on uh, 125 patients. And then uh, I continue to provide the program and more and more patients uh, improved. I have probably seen two or 3,000 patients uh, in the past, in, in, since 2011 who've gone through the program. Uh, we have hardly ever seen anyone who did not improve. I mean, that's something that I can tell you from my clinical experience. But what we decided to do is to see if this program also helps with patients who have traumatic brain injury. Uh, so we published another study just recently, um, and we provided a similar program for patients who have concussions, whether one concussion or uh, two or three or 10 concussions, and they, are, they have had persistent con concussion symptoms for than three months. It's called post-concussion syndrome. And we did a statistical analysis, and they improved. And then most recently, this is work in progress, we have provided a similar program for patients with attention deficit disorder. And so we see similar results. And because I'm a clinician in a clinical practice, I do see my patients over time. So when people come six months later, a year later, I still see them after they finish the program. So, um, and the other thing we do, we just don't rely on people telling us they feel better. We use uh, validated, computerized uh, neurocognitive evaluation by third parties who are not in our system. They're not my staff. This is a standard battery of tests that are by computer. And people who do the testing uh, are not people who actually do the training. And it, the testing is different than the brain training they get. You'll be cheating if, for example, I give people a brain game and then make a cognitive testing, which is specifically the same as the brain games. That will be not, you know, that will be like just not, you know, not a good way. So we've seen results in thousands of patients and we've used cognitive evaluations to see that these are objective improvements. Okay. It, this is a no-brainer. <laughs> it's, really, it's easy. So I wanted to, I, I was going to ask you about the concussion and traumatic brain injury. Um, you know, obviously athletes are high risk, um, contact sports athletes. Um, people have had repeated concussions. But the danger there um, appears in terms of what we know for CTE is you mimic the dementia symptoms. So you form, um, you know, the, the hallmarks of Alzheimer's, the plaques, the tangles become present from the repeated injury in the brain. So how could, I mean, how could it, can we take people like athletes, do you believe, off that road by um, brain training, or is it much like dementia, where you're when you're on that road, there's not a lot you could do to reverse it? Yes, what you just last said is correct. It's a spectrum of symptoms and and brain injury. You know, if you have two brain injury playing hockey is one thing. If you've been knocked out five thousand times uh, being uh, playing football and be uh, getting hit left and right 
throughout your life, that's a different story. Uh, we have seen patients who have had traumatic brain injury and have symptoms and we see them, but these are not the same as people who have CTE. Unfortunately, by the time a person has such severe cognitive and behavioral and emotional symptoms uh, to qualify to sort of diagnose of cognitive uh, CTE, cr uh, crying traumatic encephalopathy, we can't help. So we do have some football players, retired football players who have dementia issues, and I take care of them, I'm a clinician. You know, I do take care of them, we take care of their sleep, we take care of their behavioral problems. But unfortunately, there comes a point where uh, the amount of results you get with not only brain training, but diet, exercise, sleep, uh, meditation, and brain training uh, may not see may not see a significant results in a short period of time. I don't think yeah. it's ever hopeless. I think that there's always a little help, uh, but you want to see results that are quite apparent within months. You know, if something takes two years and you have 5% improvement, it's really hard to justify the resources needed to provide that kind of treatment for people. Uh, but if it's free and, and, and nobody is complaining, then I, I always help everybody. Well, it's and it's also just knowing that there are things that we can do for our brains and on a very small scale. I mean, I've talked about my running before. When I don't run, I'm completely off task. So there is, I can feel that connection between physical exercise and my brain. Um, I think the hardest part about our brains, of course, is that you don't see the changes. You know, it's not like lifting weights where you see the muscles changing. Um, but but to a certain extent, we can definitely feel them. Um, well, actually, it, it, I'm sorry to interrupt you. So we did the MRIs because we wanted to know whether uh, these programs, these interventions, do make a change in the volume of the brain. Uh, as you know, the hippocampus is almost the size of your thumb. You have one on the right, one on the left. And this is the part of the brain that shrinks the most with aging. And this is the part of the brain that causes memory problems. And uh, so when we did the program, when we published a paper in the Journal of Prevention of Alzheimer's Disease, we found that half our patients did have significant improvements in the volume of their hippocampus. Half of them didn't. And the, 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 the half the patients who did had improved uh, the volume of the uh, uh, hippocampus by about 3%, which is as if they had a brain that was six years younger since the rate of atrophy is 0.5% per year. So we did see, and for some patients, the difference before and after was so noticeable that you can just look at the MRI and compare images and see you have improved. Well, I would take that percentage <laughs> every yeah. little bit, right? It's like, that. that's not, that's not yeah. bad. Most people don't appreciate that their brain is a dynamic place. The brain is not like ear or it's not like a nose, it's not a fixed structure. It's really like a muscle. If it just sits there, it just sits there. And if you don't use it, it gradually shrinks. You know, and on average, an 80 year old will have less muscle mass than a 40 year old. But they have some that's enough for them to, to walk a little bit. Um, but it is changing. And if you get a 70 year old and you put them on a diet, a high protein diet, and you work them, uh, their muscle size will improve and the improvement can be noticeable in their size of the muscle and strength of the muscle. It's exactly the same. In fact, I feel that brain training and see results with uh, neuroplasticity is easier than the muscles. Yeah. Um, your brain has an amazing amount of malleability. Okay, well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Fatuhi. If people want to know more about NeuroGrow, uh, where should they go? I, I assume you have a website. Yes, we do have a website called neurogrow.com. Uh, and you've also of, written books. What's the name of your book that we should read if we want to understand the brain? Uh, is it yeah, the, the most recent book I have uh, published is uh, Boost Your Brain. And uh, it's available on Amazon and elsewhere. Um, I also have a lot of uh, public lectures that have been uh, taped and are available on YouTube. So if somebody wants to just watch some of my videos, they're available. And we also have uh, 
a website and in it has a lot of information about the things we talked about and I have a blog and I have a Twitter account. So Okay. Well, we know where to get you. Um, so thank you so much for sharing um, your information. I'm definitely thinking about all the brain games that I can do to help my brain. Um, and, you know, please keep us abreast of your research. Um, we hugely respect, um, you know, science that is also focused on health and how we maintain our brain health. And, um, you know, the fact that you have seen so many patients and have published studies um, is, is great. So thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, um, so for more on these brain talks, we always post them on beingpatient.com. If you, um, if there's an area that you want to know about, what we want to do is bring the experts to you so they can address your questions as well. Um, if you haven't done so so far, please sign up for our newsletter on beingpatient.com. We'll keep you abreast of upcoming talks. Um, thanks very much for joining us.